The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Today is Thursday, July 14th, and we welcome you to Maryland DBA's Employment First Transformation, uh, Part 2, Provider Transformation and Redesign. So um, this uh, session has two presenters today. We have Stacy Jones from the um, Institute of Community Inclusion, and we also have Lori Sedleski from Ardmore. Um, before we begin, I'm going to um, let you know that this is um, everyone's in listen only mode. And um, there are two options for listening by computer and phone. You can go to the audio section in the panel and you can switch if um, one isn't working for you. Um, we are recording the session and um, that will be posted on the DBA website and on YouTube. Um, we'll have a few polls uh, later on and I think that's about it. Oh, did I say anything about the handouts? Okay, handouts are in the handout section um, in the panel as well. So now I'd like to introduce Stacy Jones. Thanks, Donna. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to be back today for part two of this two-part webinar series, again, made possible through a partnership with the State Employment Leadership Network and the Institute for Community Inclusion at UMass Boston. A few weeks ago was part one, and during that uh, presentation, we spent some time um, giving some context to prepare for today. So Donna, if you could move to the first slide. This will give you a visual of kind of where we started uh, a few weeks ago. We talked about the national landscape related to employment first and systems change, and specifically about DDA's vision and, and their systems change initiatives and all of the pieces that have gone into that over many years. I then touched on how this landscape leads to the focus on more person-centered outcomes specifically competitive integrated employment and community life engagement, as opposed to more program specific outcomes. And before we move to the next slide, we wanna just do an, another quick poll like we did a few weeks ago so we can see who's joining us on today's call. So Donna, whenever you're able, you're gonna select the role that best fits you Again, you might be more than one role, but just choose one. If one of these does not fit your role, you can choose other. We just like to have a sense of who's on these type of webinars. Okay, so it looks like most people on this call are from provider organizations. We've got some family members, we've got CCSs, and so we've got um, a segment of other. So if you are part of a provider organization, we have a second poll so we can better understand the role that you might have at that organization. So Donna's gonna pop that second poll up. Are you an employment staff, a day services staff, mid-level manager, a senior leadership, or other? And I understand that's very common for people to wear more than one hat, so just choose whatever best aligns to your current role. Okay, so we've got a good mix. We've got a lot of senior leadership, mid-level managers, employment staff, some day hub staff, and some other. So that's great. Glad to, for every one of you to be here. No matter what your role is, this is, uh, this is information that we want to be able to share. And Donna, if you can move to the next slide. And this, this graphic that's on the next slide, again, 
is something that I shared last time. And it seems like part of it's not showing up, Donna. You may need to, there we go. Shows that there are multiple drivers of this large scale systems redesign and transformation effort. It includes long standing national policies or initiatives like the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act or WIOA, the National Employment First Movement, the CMS final settings rule, and the Olmstead decision. But as I mentioned last time, it's also really important to recognize that these specific initiatives do not exist in a vacuum and are impacted by many other factors. Two big ones that I mentioned a few weeks ago include the response to and the impact of the pandemic, as well as the ongoing na national workforce crisis. And also added here is the transition into the LTSS billing system and the new service delivery system and all of the things that go along with that transformation as well. So the fact that there are multiple drivers here, multiple factors, multiple initiatives makes it even more critical that we look at things in a holistic and comprehensive way. And particularly as we frame today's discussion about provider transformation and, tra and redesign. Next slide, please. So during part one of the webinar, we touched on Maryland DDA's move away from a system that was historically very attendance-based in its service delivery and the shift to more outcome-oriented service delivery. And at a high level, this really means focusing more on individualized um, employment outcomes and integrated community participation outcomes. It means a system that is focused on the development of a skilled workforce. And because we're focused on those employment and community outcomes, this means we need a workforce that has the capacity to facilitate community connections and to support employment outcomes. And we recognize and acknowledge that these may be different skill sets than direct support professionals of, of the past. Um, and this new service delivery really requires that providers build in a high level of flexibility to meet a variety of needs. Um, and the bottom line of that is that, that those, this really requires a different business model than a business model that supported more historic facility-based models of support. Next slide, please. So I wanna to start today's discussion by talking for a minute about the 10 elements necessary for successful organizational transformation. And these 10 elements that are showing on the screen right now came from research that was conducted together by Institute for Community Inclusion and ARC of the United States. And their research used the Delphi process, which is essentially a process that establishes consensus from a group of experts in a given area. And in this case, and the case of the 10 elements, those experts were executive directors of organizations that support primarily people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Those organizations at the time of this research no longer used subminimum wage and had also undergone their provider transformation within the last 10 years. And based on, again, the research of these organizations and these executive directors, the elements that this group identified as being necessary for transformation are the ones that we see listed here. So having um, and communicating clear and consistent goals, creating a culture that supports inclusion, having an active person-centered job placement process, strong internal and external communications, the importance of reallocating and restructuring resources to meet the organization's goals, and that's one we're gonna talk more about today, the importance of ongoing professional development and staff training, having a customer focus and engagement with those customers, quality assurance initiatives and oversight, including data management, having a holistic approach to supporting people and service delivery, and finally, cultiv cultivating multiple and diverse community partnerships. And if you'd like to find out more about the 10 elements, who was involved in the research and get a deeper dive, um, again, Donna noted that this PowerPoint uh, handout, it, you're able to download it from the side panel. And when you download it, you're able to access a hyperlink that will take you into more information about the 10 elements. Um, next slide, please. 
And even though the last graphic showed those 10 elements listed in a column from top to bottom and in, in some sort of order, it's critically important to note that when we're talking about these 10 elements, that they don't necessarily happen in a linear way when they're, when they're being looked at through the transformation process or in a specific order. Instead, it may look more like the graphic that's up on your screen right now, which shows kind of a few buckets, including focus and values, infrastructure, employment consultant practices. And all three of these buckets and all of these elements are really working together and all at the same time to support organizations through the successful transformation. All of the 10 elements may be in play at the same time. Others may take priority based on the needs of the organization and various circumstances, one of which um, we'll talk about a little bit today, things like a pandemic, the, um, priority shift, and, and things may look different from time to time. And it's important to also remember and be aware that each organization has its own unique history, unique culture, and operations, and that means that transformation will not look exactly the same from provider to provider. Again, also on the slide, there's a hyperlink when you download the presentation that will take you to the ThinkWork um, Agency Change Toolkit where you can find more in-depth information um, about these, these 10 elements. Next slide. And before I more formally introduce my partner for today's webinar, I wanna provide a quick overview of a partnership that was kicked off back in 2020 between the DDA and the Institute for Community Inclusion called the Maryland Technical Assistance Project. Back in 2020, employment for providers across Maryland were invited to submit applications to receive technical assistance to improve their employment outcomes. And out of those applications submitted, there were eight providers that were chosen. Um, the technical assistance was offered to those eight providers beginning in October of 2020, and it ended in February of 2022, so just earlier this year. And I want to note that the original planning and the format for this TA was to include some in-person components and <clears throat> trainings, but due to the pandemic, the TA activities were all shifted to virtual and remote. Next slide. The focus area of this technical assistance project included organizational transformation, specifically focused on increasing competitive integrated employment outcomes, increasing community-based service delivery, and also had a component that was specifically focused on improving or developing leadership skills among various levels of staff, including middle managers. Next slide. And the TA included a couple of things. First, there was an initial site visit and an organizational assessment. Again, this was done virtually because this was in October of 2020. Um, the initial assessment included conversations with key stakeholders within those organizations like board members, people receiving services, families, different levels of staff, managers, et cetera. Then each of the TA staff from ICI worked directly with each provider to develop an individualized work plan that was customized and des uh, mm -hmm. designed to support their identified outcomes. There were monthly TA calls that happened with each provider, as well as monthly calls with the learning community that was made up of key staff from all eight of those provider organizations. Built into this TA, like I mentioned, was also a leadership training series that was designed specifically for mid-managers and other key staff to help support the development of, of leadership skills. Um, and there were also opportunities throughout the, the the project for more individualized training opportunities based on identified needs that came up for each organization. Next slide. And now that I've shared a little bit about that initiative, I'm thrilled to have um, joining me today, Lori Sudleski. Lori is the CEO of Ardmore Enterprises in Prince George's County. And Ardmore is one of the those eight provider organizations that received uh, TA throughout the initiative that I just talked about. And today, Lori and I are going to be talking through a few of the elements that I referenced a few slides ago. Um, and I will provide some general examples of what strategies providers employ related to some of those elements 
And then Lori's going to talk more specifically about how Ardmore um, used that element or how it played into Ardmore's transformation. And I also want to point out before we get started that all, although my current role is as a staff of ICI, during the time frame that Ardmore was receiving this technical assistance, I was also working at Ardmore as the Director of Employment and Day Services. So you may hear me reference some work that we did together during that stage of transformation. So this provides a, a unique opportunity for the two, two of us to have a discussion about Ardmore's transformation. Um, Lori, welcome. Um, I'll let you start by providing a brief history of Ardmore um, for anybody that may not be familiar with your organization. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you to ICI and Maryland DDA for hosting this webinar and inviting me today. Back in 2020 and in part of 2021, Ardmore was um, one of the recipients of the technical assistance through the Maryland TAP project, and I'm happy to be here today to share a little bit about our experience. <clears throat> As some of you may know, Ardmore has been around for a while. We've been providing services for almost 60 years. Um, over the years, the services have continuously evolved to meet the changing needs of the community. Starting as a daycare provider for young children with disabilities um, and until, the, until the form that we are today in serving adults with disabilities across service areas. We currently provide meaningful day and employment service to over 125 adults with disabilities. We also provide residential services, supported living and personal supports. I joined Ardmore in 2020, six months into the pandemic. Since that time, we have been able to take a number of steps that have been critical to the successful transformation. I will share a little bit more with you as we move forward. Next slide, please. Thanks, Lori. And again, even though the elements, as, as I referenced earlier, have order have numbers corresponding with them, I want to point out again, the elements referenced are not in a particular order. And we want to highlight just a few of them in a deeper dive today. And we want to start with element number five, which is the reallocation and restructuring of resources. Transforming an organization means really ensuring that all of the existing resources and resources could include things like your staff, buildings, other assets, that those things are aligned to meet the vision that you have for the organization on the other side of your transformation efforts. So this really means taking a look at how staff budget their time and energy and when providing services. For instance, if you have staff dedicated to finding jobs for people, really taking a critical look at where most of their time is spent. Is it spent getting to know job seekers through activities of discovery? Is it spent meeting with employers, engaging in informational interviews? Or instead, are they asked to do things like uh, provide transportation or uh, other things that may not necessarily lead to employment outcomes that are part of your transformation goals and objectives. It may also mean diversifying your funding so that you aren't relying on only one source of income or revenue and looking at the impact of and planning for transition away from things like contract or sheltered work or other things that your organization may be um, phasing out. Next slide, please. And an example of this reallocation and restructuring of resources that can include freeing up financial capital to create new positions that can then be used to support transformation efforts or that could be invested into staff training and development or other initiatives. For many provider organizations, uh, there is a lot of financial capital that might be tied up in a building or buildings where traditionally services have taken place. Next slide. And so here I'm going to ask Lori to just describe how and why Ardmore made the decision to sell their building and a little bit more about that process. Thanks, Stacy. So on this slide, you see a couple of photos, and those are photos of the interior of the center of our old building. Um, where we used to provide center-based services, daytime services. Um, so when I joined in um, August of 2020, 
it was clear that the organization had already been discussing and preparing for the move to fully community-based integrated services. But um, to that date, they had not made a whole lot of progress and were still providing all of their services in the center. The Ardmore did provide some employment services at that time and a few people were receiving supported employment. Then of course the pandemic hit and the center closed down in March 2020 per the public health emergency. When I was hired in August, it was clear that the board was interested in moving the organization forward toward more individualized integrated supports. At that time, I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to put the full transition plan into place. There wasn't gonna be another opportunity where the doors were already closed and this seemed like um, the time to, to, to move forward. The building was already on the market and had been on the market um, for some time, but we were um, struggling with the sale of the building. Um, so we did make some progress on that. Uh, it was a painful process, but we were able to move forward in selling the building. Of course, when the doors closed uh, during the public health uh, emergency, we uh, Appendix K came into place, and at Ardmore here, we moved into providing both virtual and telesupports to the majority of people who had been supported at the center. A few of the people that we served started receiving family supports. But it was unanimous among our leadership and key stakeholders that we would not reopen the doors. So knowing that, we moved forward with the sale of the building. We were looking forward to a time that the money would not be spent on things like um, leaky roofs or um, air conditioning not working one day, um, just the, the expenses that occur when you um, are running a large building like that, repairs and other expenses. So it, we were planning that we would be saving a significant amount of money and would be able to channel that back into our service delivery. So having said that, this was still an unexpected opportunity. And while the decision was made because we were in a unique position, we had not yet done any real strategic planning related to transformation efforts. But we knew that without this shift, people would continue to be tied to the building. So we um, aggressively moved forward and funds were dedicated to our transformation efforts rather than the building. Next slide, please. Thank you, Lori. And thank you for <laughs> mentioning the fact that it was it was a painful process. It wasn't something that you all took lightly. <laughs> um, and I think that's a theme that, that Lori and I both will will mention today that none of this um, is easy. Uh, and there were a lot of tough things that went along with that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, another type of reallocation or restructuring may also come from creation of a new organizational structure that better aligns with existing staff resources, again, to the activities that are going to increase employment and community participation outcomes. Lori, can you talk a little bit about how Ardmore approached some of this organizational restructuring? And next slide, please, Donna. Sure. So early on, we, we looked at, at what the organizational structure, how it needed to change. Um, what would it need to look like to best support outcomes and, and get away from the attendance model? So, of course, we started with our day and employment department as a whole and envisioned a new structure, um, translating it into what we called community support teams. I'll talk a little bit more about the community support teams on the next slide. But in this restructure, we wanted to make sure that we created a structure that would allow for flexibility in service delivery. It would also support the development of individualized schedules for people. And we wanted to ensure that it built in the coordination with families and residential providers, including our own residential services, for a completely holistic approach. And finally, we wanted to make sure that we were using staff creatively across our services in order to achieve our goals. Next slide, please. So this is a visual that represents our community support teams. Each team is designed to support about 35 people with disabilities in our day and employment services. On each team, there's a manager of our day services, a person-centered planning specialist, 
And, and this role is, at Ardmore, this role is the person who works on um, the whole pre-planning and planning process to make sure that a person's um, plan gets put into place, gets submitted, gets approved, and um, implementation strategies align with the plan. Also available on each of the teams are community support specialists, and they are who provide the um, community development services. They are the DSPs and the employment staff, if a person has a goal related to employment. We wanted people to experience their service delivery at Ardmore as being more seamless than they had in the past, and um, to not feel kind of the shifting back and forth based on an outcome that might be related to a different department. So this team-centered approach was an effort to provide more seamless services. Um, I will mention, um, before I move on with the community support teams, we also spent a lot of time there organization-wide working on eliminating the service silos. So there were very clear silos in the organization at that time. And we did feel that in order to provide the best service that was focused on the person's goal and not what a service should look like, um, that we needed to make sure we broke down our internal silos and this meant a huge culture change. Um, so while we've made a lot of progress and the structural changes that we put into place helped the cultural change to occur, it is something that is ongoing and it needs constant attention. So back to the community support teams, we have four of these teams and each of them is geographically based. We spent a lot of time looking at where people live and orienting where their services would occur to that area as opposed to Ardmore's building being the centralized location. Once we put the plan into place, we had to redraft all the job descriptions. We ensured that we had the right roles represented on each of the teams and were hiring the right people to fill these roles. We also had to ensure that we were communicating this process to all stakeholders in ways that make sense. And I'll talk about that a little bit more soon. But this was not a quick and easy um, piece of the transformation process. And this restructure, this reorganization alone took about 10 months to put into place. Next slide, please. Thank you, Lori. And that's a perfect segue to the next element that we want to focus on for a minute. And that is having a strong internal and external communication plan. So when you're undergoing a comprehensive transformation, it's important that there's communication to all stakeholders at each stage of the transformation and that all of these communications match each other. And this ensures that everyone knows what's going on and that stakeholders have an opportunity to be part of the process and the decision making. And you just heard Lori outline a lot of extensive changes that happened at Ardmore um, so it stands to reason that people need to know what's happening and have to have that communication. So Lori, can you talk a little bit about some of the strategies that Ardmore used and continues to use, because this is still ongoing, related to communication? Next slide. So on this slide, you'll see um, some examples of the different types of communications that we used. Um, I will say that you know, effectively communicating all of the changes when you're in the process of creating the change is very challenging. And it, we did learn pretty quickly that it was one of the most critical pieces to the success of the effort. So this included both internal and external communications. Um, how we were managing our internal communications to make sure that everybody was understanding where we were going and was on the same page in the, during the journey as well as all of the external communications with family members and other stakeholders. So adjusting the message for the audience was important. And we learned that it would take a number of communications with family members and with staff to help them understand the direction we were heading and what that would mean to their family member who was receiving services. We developed monthly webinars that we named Hello Ardmore. Hello Ardmore was a 30 minute webinar that we held monthly designed to inform family members, people supported, and staff on the changes that were taking place. There was a fair amount of repetition in our Hello Ardmore webinars. We repeated some things monthly, 
Um, this was also, of course, during the pandemic. So we also did a lot of discussion around our safety protocols. But there was this repeti rep repetition, and, and we really did that to make sure that we were, we were kind of hammering the message home. Um, we also had multiple uh, parties on, the, on these webinars, so the people supported staff and family members, because we wanted to make sure that everybody was hearing the same thing. We didn't want to be having communications with family members, family members going to staff and saying, well, we were told this and this and that. We wanted to make sure that staff and family members um, were hearing consistent messaging. So we found this to be pretty helpful initially, and um, in turn, it helped to prepare families um, and CCSs and other stakeholders for the one-to-one -one conversations that needed to happen. So that was one of our strategies. Um, we also built FAQs uh, that could be used internally. And I, I will say in the beginning, I thought that this was a little bit of overkill, but soon learned that having it in print and having it um, designed in such a way that was attractive was really key to people using it and understanding where we were going and what that process looked like. So while we in leadership, we, we eat and drink transformation, right? We've been talking about it here in Maryland for years, and um, we all understand it conceptually and to some degree in operation. Um, but DSPs do not have that same level of exposure to the conversations. Um, and so purposeful communications and tools that will be helpful to the DSPs and the different management levels was really necessary. This is still going. We are currently updating our website to better reflect how our services look. So our communication efforts around transformation continue, and I'm sure they will continue for some time. Um, but it was important, and I think if there's one piece of advice I could give to others, it's to really think about the many different strategies that you're gonna use to support all the varied stakeholders about your transformation process. Next slide, please. So here's an example of another tool that we used, and this was an infographic for our Meaningful Day Services team. So this view, there's a front and a back actually, but the front is a quick overview of the services we are providing. And then in the back, you see more um, plain language explanation. So we wanted a tool that everybody could look at, directors, managers, direct support staff, um, that clearly showed um, what the process was and that we were being consistent when we communicated with CCSs, families, et cetera, about our transformation process. And because Ardmore has a long history um, of providing services, many years of providing services in a center, this process also helped us to align everyone's expectations when we talked about meaningful day services and employment and what that would look like. Next slide, please. Thank you, Lori. As I referenced early on in one of the graphics today, we also want to take a few minutes to consider how other factors like LTSS implementation and emerging from the COVID pandemic, how that has impacted transformation efforts. So we're gonna to touch on a few of those elements today. Next slide. So for most service providers, service delivery obviously fundamentally shifted in response to COVID and shifting back to the way things used to be just wasn't feasible or realistic. Not only had providers changed and service delivery had changed, um, again, Lori touched on some of the, the, the flexibilities allowable through Appendix K and how Ardmore in particular shifted to meet those flexibilities. But we also know that people's lives had changed. And this means taking time to look at whether people's needs had also changed and needs through that were being met through service delivery. We know because we heard pretty frequently that people in services and their families liked the flexibility that came along with providing virtual services and, and other flexibilities like family support through Appendix K. And we also know that there's a continuing workforce shortage, which highlights even more the importance of staff career development and opportunities for those staff long term um, so that they want to, to stay in the field and continue to do work in this field. 
Um, a big part of emerging from the pandemic for providers includes identifying and being clear about current capacity. So for instance, if staffing levels don't support that traditional Monday through Friday, nine to three schedule for all people in services, are there different ways to look at scheduling that might be more flexible and meet people's needs differently? And I'm gonna ask Lori just to talk a little bit about how Ardmore um, approached emerging from the pandemic. Next slide, please. Thanks, Stacy. So as we started getting ready for um, increasing our in-person services in July of 2021, we knew that, um, well, we knew we weren't going back to the old model. We knew we were gonna be doing things very differently, but we also knew that the people that we would be supporting had changed over the past um, year and a half, just as all of us changed while we were in the pandemic and spent many months in, in our homes um, until vaccines came around. So we also had, during that time, of course, we, um, we needed less staff um, and we had some staff turnover and um, we had staff who were trained um, differently um, than what we would be needing. So when the time came as we started preparing, it meant that we, we knew that our staff didn't yet know the people that they were gonna be supporting or they didn't know them in, in the way that was necessary um, to be in the community. So what I mean by that is understanding a person that's being supported um, within the context of a center, it's very different than understanding the needs and the desires of a person supported when they have the opportunity to be out in the community and participating in different activities. So we knew that there would be this process of learning about people again. And we knew that that needed to be where we started and to be a priority. So um, I'll tell you about that in a minute, but we also made sure that we had our ongoing virtual service delivery um, was continued to evolve and was purposeful and meaningful to people because we knew that that was not gonna be going away um, quickly either. So um, we needed to take a look at the schedules for service delivery and our staff. Um, and how that looked different when people are out in the community receiving services versus um, being bused into uh, the center, the centralized building. So it means that we spent time looking at transportation logistics, um, the shifts that people would be working. It wasn't gonna be necessarily getting in at 8.30 and leaving at 3.30, but, but how, how much time was a person gonna be served and thus what did it mean for the different teams in play. We also knew that the physical stamina had changed for the people that we would be serving. And so we needed to take that into account and we needed to figure out a way to learn more about them uh, so we could get them back into a schedule of leaving their homes and participating in the community, but doing it in a way that was manageable and would help them kind of grow into that process. So, all that said, we also knew that as we were working with each individual to determine their, their likes, their interests, and what they wanted to do, we just didn't have as many opportunities in the community because certain businesses had closed. Um, they had new rules about how many people could be in buildings. Um, everything was, as you all know, it was, shapes had shifted, right? Everything looked really different. Um, so one of the things that we did is we hired a community development coordinator who could help us in making connections with organizations in the community and develop partnerships um, and bring them to the community support teams as they worked on building the individual schedules for each of the people that we supported. So during this learning process, um, we knew that we were going to be shifting a lot because we kept learning about uh, people and we kept kind of learning lessons. What we thought we might be doing in the community couldn't actually happen because it was closed. So it, it quickly became clear that if we were going to succeed at this, we needed to make sure that we could be agile and dynamic in the process. Next slide, please. So on the last slide, I referenced getting to know people again, and I'm, I'm talking about this a little bit more in depth. Um, 
but we did have a process that we used um, that was to work with the people we supported, the staff and families, and that was called um, using pr positive personal profiles. So we actually developed a positive personal profile for each person. And there's a lot of different ways to format um, a tool like this, but we, we started with a pretty simple one. We wanted to ensure that people could talk about um, the positive personality traits that a person had and what was important to and important for the person. Any relationships that that person had that we wanted to be aware of and make sure that we were helping to maintain previous community or employment experiences and other hobbies or past activities the person might have been engaged in. Um, it's a lot to learn and, and it doesn't always come easily when you've been working with somebody in a center and you think you know them, but they haven't had the exposure to various opportunities in the community. So this, this um, process of the positive personality traits and starting to look at people for the gifts they have um, was, was important. And, and I do think that, that was, there were some growing pains in that process. Um, we continue to use those tools and they are helpful. We did find that a lot of information had been lost over time during the pandemic. I'm sure many of you have found that as well and with staff turnover. Um, so these profiles were key and we see them as living documents that are used as part of our ongoing service delivery. We went into the process not assuming any previous knowledge, but instead um, kind of starting from scratch and making sure that that anything we documented was accurate. This is different than a risk assessment, and I kind of want to be clear about that because we did not come about at this in terms of thinking, what do we need to be aware of that a person cannot do? Instead, we were thinking about um, what can, what will this person do? This meant engaging and, and participation versus protecting and getting to know the, the person within the context of their lives and their families versus through the lens of a day program. So different than a risk as assessment, this was an important approach. Um, it was engaging uh, people to learn about their, their gifts and their skills. And, and we tried to put the concept of just being about protecting and, um, and safety, you know, I don't wanna say on the back burner, but, but we wanted to be proactive and positive in our approach. So getting to know people within the context of their own lives versus within the walls of the day program. As we used these personal uh, profiles, um, we wanted to make sure that we continue to use the tool to build next steps and possibilities um, about what people were interested in, what they were doing, and learning, um, learning more about them and potentially future job goals. Next slide, please. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story about one of the people that we support. Um, this gentleman's name is Kevin, and Kevin used to work at Ardmore as a receptionist um, in our administrative building, which of course was attached to the center. So as you, um, so some of you will know this because you have day services. You know the um, people supported might be kind of moving through the administrative building at different times, and, and it was a very social role. Um, Kevin loved that role, and, and he got to be communicating with people often and, and um, contributing in that way. When the pandemic hit, though, of course, um, we closed and everybody went to work remotely, so we did not need a, a receptionist, and um, just the phone skills was, was not really gonna work. So um, up to that time, Kevin had had com limited employment opportunities and um, had mainly been at the, at the reception position. So his perspective on what he was good at or what he wanted to do was somewhat limited to that job. But because we were going through the transformation, we thought it was important that working with Kevin, we took a step back and we made sure that he actually went through a discovery process. And that was not only gonna help us um, to learn what would be, be a good match for him, but for him to discover himself some of the other skills that he had and what are the different things that he could be doing. We did do an uh, information interview with the 
um, receptionist position because he saw it posted and he wanted to, um, he really wanted that position. We also had some board members and staff people who were also thought, let's just go ahead and give Kevin that position. Um, but we were holding fast to the principle of the transformation and, and making sure that we had a thorough discovery process. So um, our employment team engaged him in that process and um, explored different opportunities with Kevin. And I'm happy to say that he now has a job with the Prince George's public school system. And he is a dedicated aide in a um, elementary school system. So this job is an incredible match for him. He is very happy. Um, so far, they are very happy with him. And um, he recently spoke at our annual meeting and it was just really touching to hear um, to hear how happy he is and, and what a good match it is. One thing about Kevin is he always wants to be helping others. And while that was, you know, evident and kind of cool while he was a receptionist, it's it's not the role of the receptionist necessarily, but in his new role as a dedicated aide, his desire to be helping and supporting others um, is really is really used, right? So he really gets to do what what he loves to do. So we really feel that Kevin is a success story of what that new process for um, employment should look like. Next slide, please. Thank you, Lori, and thank you for sharing that story about Kevin. I think that really uh, encapsulates everything that you're talking about here. Uh, I wanna also recognize along with kind of talking about emerging from the pandemic and all of the ways that might impact transformation. Many Maryland providers are still planning for alignment from the legacy services and billing system, PCIS2, into the LTSS system. Some providers may have already completed that alignment, but not all of them. So I also want to include, and we want to talk about a few things um, that providers are doing to prepare. Again, there have been other webinars and resources prov provided about this particular type of alignment. Um, so this is really meant to be more of a high level touch on these. This alignment really is ensuring that there's an understanding of the outcomes people want in their lives. And this should be done with the person and their CCS through a robust person-centered planning process. And for providers, to work with people and their families and CCSs to ensure that the person's plan then includes appropriate services. For instance, when um, because Ardmore was selling their building, as Lori talked about in the beginning, it was important for people to understand that day habilitation as a service was no longer going to be an option through Ardmore's service delivery. So there was a lot of communication that had to happen again, with people in services, their families, CCSs, staff, to ensure that people, first of all, understood that, understood why it was happening, and could make a decision about whether people wanted to continue to receive day services from Ardmore through community development services instead of day habilitation. And if yes, then those changes had to happen in people's plans. And something Lori mentioned, a little while ago is that there was a lot of repetition in communication because people may not have heard it the first time or may not have completely understood the first few times that they heard about something. So these were things that, that were communicated out um, as well. But we also wanted to ensure that people were approved and authorized for a service that they may likely and reasonably would need. And Lori will talk a little bit more about how Ardmore approached that in, in just a few slides. Uh, next slide, please. So along with planning with people, like I just said, planning and, and making sure that people understand about any changes that might be affecting them. And again, for Ardmore, that the big change was a shift away from day habilitation. Also important is planning um, internally as an organization for that alignment to LTSS and some things to look at. Um, ensuring that you look at staff capacity to provide the services that the provider is approved to, to provide. So for instance, if, a, if, if an organization will be billing for discovery or job development services, 
are the right staffing capacities and skills and resources in place for that? Um, and if not, identifying what needs to happen to get ready for that. Another big component that emerges when shifting from billing in PCIS2 to LTSS is acknowledging that everyone, not everyone, will necessarily want or need six to eight hours a day of day services in the way that day services have historically been provided. So that means ensuring that you're doing the work to determine what types of schedules and services people might be looking for. And I think. Uh, Lori would agree that a challenge about having these type of discussions during the pandemic is people weren't physically coming into a building anymore to, to have services. So a lot of the discussion about what, would, what services would look like on the other side of COVID uh, weren't always easy. And so that's why I would just wanna reiterate what Lori said, taking the time to get to know people within the context of not necessarily through the context of day services, but through the context of their lives, their families, their communities, where those services were gonna be happening was another important part of having those discussions. And again, I'm gonna pass things off to Lori so she can talk about some specific things that Ardmore did to prepare and, and have been doing to plan for this alignment into LTSS. Next slide, please. Thanks, Stacey. Um, so as we headed into the process, it, it, as many of you know who are in this process now, there's a lot of different pieces to it. There's a lot of, um, it's a multi-pronged approach, right? It's not linear, it's kind of all over the place. Um, so we realized pretty quickly that we needed to think about how to do this in a very holistic way. And um, so we actually identified a work group um, and we had someone come in and do some facilitated discussion with us. Um, and part of that was because I felt like some of the organization who was most directly involved with the transformation really understood it. And while others would listen to the words and hear us in other departments, I didn't know if they were really understanding the impact it would have across the organization. So, um, so to me, the, the, one of the most important aspects of that group process is that people understood that everybody in the organization is going to be touched by this and is a part of the transformation. Everybody understood the why of, of why we were doing it. This isn't just about billing changes or it isn't about we need to restructure jobs, but why are we doing it? And um, so I think that, that that work group was successful in that way. And, and we walked away with um, some strategies for each of the various departments to start align themselves. You know, so this process helped us to, 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 um, to think about how the, the people we support, they're baked into the services. So anything that's happening in our organization is happening because of a person. Um, and, and, specific to our service departments, we needed to make sure that we had a strong internal process to support each person, um, have a robust pre-planning process with uh, the person and family members. And so we spent a lot of time providing training and mentoring and um, kind of, you know, learning sessions, just engaging in conversations with managers, um, with our person-centered planning specialists who really had to start redesigning the way they did things, um, talking about the why of this shift and, and what it meant to the actual process of uh, the person-centered planning process from the start to the end, um, end meaning approval of the plan in LTSS and um, effective billing uh, for it. So, we also coordinated heavily with our CCS agencies so they understood where we are in the transformation. Of course, we're a lot further now. We still work closely with our CCS agencies and it's important that we're working hand in hand so we get all plans to, to where they need to be um, for the moment when we are turned on in LTSS. Um, but I, I just wanna emphasize again that that's kind of about the person and, and less about the process. Um, but make sure that we're really doing a really robust person-centered process. 
and do I have the supports in our teams there to make sure that that's happening. So I do think with the additional education we've provided our person-centered specialists, with um, we've actually shrunk our teams so they have less of a caseload, um, so they should be able to provide more individualized services. I think we are um, we've made great progress towards that goal. And um, we created resources, of course, to continue to help us um, educate others and align with where we're at. We also rebuilt our employment service delivery um, um, system, basically our service delivery. We, re we rebuilt employment from, from the ground up. And um, obviously, with the transformation, that was necessary to happen. And a large part of the Maryland Technical Assistance Project helped us to move forward with that. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the aligning the employment. And as I referenced before, we engaged in, in pretty much wholesale organizational restructuring, and that included our employment services. We wanted to ensure there was a solid foundation that was built on the expectations of everybody being competitively employed in integrated settings and that how we operated aligned with our new service, employment service expectations. We started by reworking our job descriptions and um, doing some hiring to bring new staff into the organization with this new set of expectations. We engaged in a lot of staff training and development and this included both internal trainings, but also sending people to the Maryland DSP2 training, um, full participation of the employment team in the Maryland TAP leadership development training, ACRE training. Uh, we're now doing coach approach and other topical training opportunities. So this is a place where I feel like it's really obvious. I, I have a little bit more money or we have a little bit more money to, to focus on training and development and, and it isn't just kind of getting sucked into a building. So that's where I start to feel the payoff for um, getting rid of that building. We built in goals for employment staff to be mentored, prepare for, and pass the CESP certification. We also began building employment staff schedules that better aligned with the activities of each of the discrete employment services, discovery, job development, and then ongoing and follow along supports. If staff were still doing activities that didn't align with those services, then we discussed where those activities should be occurring, because perhaps it was better to be occurring with our community development services than with our employment services. Next slide, please. So the chart that you see um, is one of the ways that we used to help identify where a person would be in the process. So as we started projecting um, our services, the employment services, we developed this, it's pretty simple, straightforward chart. Um, and we, we used this um, considering what we knew about a person and their positive personal profiles. Um, so, this helped us to understand, um, we looked at the scenario and then we looked at where they would fit in terms of the services identified. So if a person is employed in community integrated employment and stable in their job, they're probably looking at follow along and transportation. If a person is employed, but it hasn't been very stable or doesn't seem to be going well, they need some additional supports or they may, it might even look like backing up, but typically it just means some more um, in-person supports a little bit more focused on building the skills that are needed for that particular job. If a person wants a new job or is employed and wants a different job, we would be looking at the addition of community development services, discovery, job development to those services. So by using a tool like this, we were able to begin charting out what our services would look like. Next slide, please. Thanks, Lori. So, sorry, did you want me to? Oh, no, you're good, you're good, go ahead. You're, I'm one <laughs> so ahead of you. I'll just talk a little bit about the fiscal impact tool too, because that was um, a really important tool for us. Um, because obviously people aren't receiving the number of hours that they were in the past, and we wanted to make sure that people 
the hours that they are receiving services, it's very meaningful supports, right? So you're looking at what they want to do and what they're doing and, and how we can support them and then determining how the hours match that. Um, so we, we use that as a planning tool. And of course, we factored in fluctuations like work schedules, vacations. If we know a person regularly takes a vacation to their family home uh, over the holidays or in the, in the um, summer, person's health history, all of that information if we had it. And then we had conversations about projecting probable and realistic schedules. So um, if we know the person only ever received day hab three times a week, four hours a day, we wanted to check in and see if that was still kind of the appropriate amount of uh, number of hours that a person should be receiving services, or if it maybe should be decreased because they're in the community doing different activities. Um, so we needed to take a look at that so we could budget appropriately. Then of course we had people who receive residential services, some people live with their family, some people receive residential, and we needed to look back at the historical information um, to determine if the person would be needing dedicated hours moving forward. Uh, so um, that was that's something that obviously was very different than in the past. If a person is not receiving six to eight hours of um, community development services or employment services, then we need to look at um, what are the dedicated um, hours that or in lieu of day that are built in. We also hired a manager of LTSS operations, and this role has been very critical to the success of our transformation to date. I have to be careful because we're not we're not done. Um, but this role has been really critical in building the tools that we needed, um, as well as providing the ongoing support or oversight of transformation. Uh, so this manager created a number of tools um, so that we know exactly where we are in the process, what we need to focus on. Uh, she provides oversight of a lot of the activities and provides technical assistance to our person-centered specialists as they are using um, the newly defined service processes. And then we also involved finance in every step of the discussion so that they were informed and prepared for this new, more intensive budgeting practice um, that would not be as static as in previous years. Uh, could fluctuate quite a bit, so we wanted to make sure that they were involved and understood what that looked like, and um, that we could that we were projecting in a way that was conservative enough, but um, but also hopefully very realistic in um, in future revenues. Next slide, please. Thanks, Lori. And I just want to take a second. It's already been mentioned a few times, but it, it is important to say it again and acknowledge that wholesale organizational transformation is not easy. It is difficult work. It takes a lot of time and it's typically pretty messy. It's not something that just neatly unfolds the way that you always want it to. As we said earlier, the 10 elements of successful transformation don't necessarily happen one after the other. And as Lori talked about, there were some real life things that got in, in the way of this. The biggest one um, at that time, at the beginning of these transformation efforts was dealing with the COVID pandemic um, and workforce shortages and any other internal or external stressor that happened to be going on um, that, that was affecting day-to-day day-to-day um, -day operations on top of also looking at transformation. So we thought it was, would be a good way to end today for Lori to reflect a little bit on Ardmore's transformation and her, as a CEO going through that process and continuing to go through that process, what are some of your lessons learned that you'd like to share, Lori? And next slide. So um, being invited to, to um, present today was actually a good opportunity for me to, to reflect. And um, you see here on the slide some of the different um, parts of transformation and, and it's messy and, and what a person needs to be thinking about. I, I will say that I think it's important to accept that there's going to be missteps. Um, you will take a wrong step and, and you'll need to correct course. Um, it's a process. It takes longer than you think it will. That is definitely true. You, you need to identify some small successes and even something that you maybe wouldn't have in the past even recognized as a success. You just need to learn to celebrate more 
and and be really careful when setting setting benchmarks. I mean, if you're going to set them high, then make sure that you are still celebrating when you fall short because you've still achieved something, um, or either just keep them really reasonable. Also, know you're going to be prioritizing and, and reprioritizing. You're going to be shifting as needed. So, what seemed like a great idea and a great strategy two months ago um, may need to be totally rethought out, either based on how it was going or new information you received. Um, about about um, desired outcomes or how the how that process was looking. So so accept that you're going to sometimes step back and shift gears, and know that as long as you keep the why um, in your mind, um, that you can shift gears. It, it isn't the end of the world if you have to shift gears, and that you just have to be flexible. I would say have faith in the process. You have to have faith in you and your organization and know that you can get where you need to be. Find your champions within the organization and make sure to um, really use that. And, and just know that you're gonna get there because you have to get there. There's really nowhere else to go. So, so keep your eye on the prize and have faith in the process. That would be, I think, my, my words of wisdom to you. Thank you. And I'm going to add one to, to the list that Lori gave, and because she won't say this about herself, but the leadership that she provided, especially during the beginning stages of, of the transformation efforts, again, when early on in the pandemic, when there was a lot of uncertainty together. So I would add in there that, that strong leadership and that vision and the being okay, as you just said, Things get messy, there are missteps, but still um, leading people forward through that. So I think it's important to acknowledge that as well. Thank you, um, Stacey. I want, if you can go to the next slide also, Donna. I wanna also um, take a minute before we do questions to announce, and this may be information that's already been shared um, by DDA, but I wanna make sure that everybody on this call also knows that there is a, a, an opportunity for a second cohort of providers to receive technical assistance through the Maryland Training and Technical Assistance Project. And this will be open to DDA funded employment providers. And those providers um, should be committed to increasing and improving competitive integrated employment and decreasing reliance on center-based services. And applications are due to DDA by September 15th, 2022, um, by 5 p.m. Eastern time. And I believe that this, if it hasn't already, the announcement with all of the details and, and the application process will be sent out by DDA. But I just wanted to, to plug that initiative um, because Lori has described what that process um, was able to, to support for her organization. So I wanna stop now and um, see if people have any questions. You may have questions for Lori. Um, and you can go to the last slide, Donna. And we do have one question already in the question box that I wanted to read. And it had to, it was from Donna. Hi, Donna. It had to do with walking through the process with a participant with the shift in roles of staff. And I think that had to do with the community support teams, Lori, yes. what, what the process was there. <clears throat> Okay, so she's referring to page 16, is that right? Yes. Okay, um, let's see if I can see that question again. So if if I under, can you go to 16, please? Um, so if I understand the correct the question correctly, you just wanna have kind of a better understanding of how that team works with the person. So, um, you know, I, if you think about kind of the layered approach or the typical hierarchy you see, we, we really try to move away from that and start thinking more in terms of teams. And um, everybody in that team is about the people we support, right? So they are in the middle. So you might have an employment staff person working with a person, you might have CDS, you have your PCP staff person working, there's a manager that should know the person. So everybody is really working in um, in concert, let me say, that would be probably how I would describe it, um, to make sure that we're providing the right service or, or the best service um, specific to that, to that person's needs. So 
we really try to kind of break down that hierarchy and, and look at things more as a team. Does that answer the question, Stacy? Is there anything you'd like to add about that process or the, how the only thing it? I would the only thing I would add is it it goes right into what you described about getting to know people differently because again we looked at creating these these community support teams and they were as much as could be done geographically focused so that people were receiving services around their home base but that meant for some people they might be shifting to receive support from staff they hadn't previously been supported by because again the previous services had been provided in Ardmore's building so I think a big part of it was going back to those positive personal profiles getting to know people and ensuring that whoever was going to be working with the person whether it was a direct support staff in day services whether it was an employment staff or whether it was a residential staff, everybody was talking together and literally sometimes on the same call talking about all the good things that we knew about a person. Um, it was a way to, to recenter those uh, that team to focus on that group of people. Um, and then adding into that, again, the, the community development piece of it, um, that team, again, which was made up of a manager, a person-centered planning specialist, employment staff, based on what they knew about people in those positive personal profiles, were able to share that information or are able to share that information to someone that's helping to then develop um, community participation um, activities and things that kind of connect it all together so it's a it was designed to be a more holistic process as Lori said as a, as opposed to just a kind of hierarchical in nature let me see what else what other questions we have Okay, somebody says many individuals may not tolerate being in the community for up to four to six hours. How was this being addressed? Lori, did you so, want to sp speak to yeah. specifically? So if a person isn't able to be in the community for four to six hours, then we don't provide services to them in the community for four to six hours. But that means then um, you need to either be coordinating with um, a group home provider or if they live with their family or supported living uh, you need to be coordinating the supports with that so we did not um, go into it thinking that everybody would move from six hours of being in a building to six hours of being in the community we absolutely knew that wouldn't be the case and we absolutely knew that we'd probably hit a take a hit on revenue for that but but um, we do believe that if we can get it right and and um, and if they have success in the community for shorter amounts of time, um, that most people will start to find more things they like and more things they want to do, and we will be providing them uh, support for longer um, for longer amounts of time. But it was really just collaborating with um, the other part of the services, and that's where kind of breaking down the silos was important to us. Um, to make sure that there was support in the home uh, when we aren't, weren't providing them support in the community. Thanks, Lori. Yeah. And I think we got all of the questions. Um, and the last slide is up again. It has Lori's email address, my email address, if people have additional questions or want to do any outreach there. Um, I want to thank Lori for being part of this webinar today and sharing Ardmore's transformation process and thank you to DDA for having us and with that we will end today's webinar thank you Lori thank you